Uh, so Janindra, um, consultant colorectal surgeon at St Mark's, where you have been for some 11 years now, I'm sure they've flashed yeah. by, uh, but I'm really pleased and delighted on behalf of all the members of the Red Lion Group to, to uh, welcome you and thank you very much for uh, giving your time this evening. Over to you. Um, thank you, David, and thank you, Gary, and thank you to the Red Lion Group for actually having me again. And uh, I'm uh, very proud, actually, to be one of the patrons of the uh, Red Lion Group now, and uh, um, I'll, I'll do my best to uh, ensure its uh, ongoing success. Um, so um, today um, I was going to talk, uh, not this similar talk to what I did last year, but we'll try and um, sort of change the pitch a little bit so we can look at it, maybe look at things from maybe a different angle. So I'll just share my screen. And we'll go to full So just while this sort of loads up, um, cause it all takes a little, Um, um, so it, it's about looking at the latest developments in pulp surgery. I have to say that between last year and this year, given the circumstances, there haven't been a massive amount of developments, but we will sort of talk about perhaps some of the ways um, we are looking at pulp surgery and, and, and actually surgery after um, ulcerative colitis really. So there are, there are actually quite a few options available for those people who um, have a colectomy for um, ulcerative colitis. So if we, are, if we are to think about a colectomy, for example, and I will sort of point on this one, because this is, the, the, this, is, this is your colon, and it sort of starts from the right side, goes across, comes to the left side, across and down. This part here that I'm pointing to, can everyone see the pointer? Yeah. Yeah. So um, this part here is called the rectum. And what we, when someone has acute severe colitis or needs a fairly urgent or even semi-urgent operation for ulcerative colitis, it's this part of the uh, colon that we remove and we usually leave the rectum behind. Now, the reason we leave the rectum behind is that Firstly, we can see that there are multiple different options that are available for the more definitive surgery in ulcerative colitis. Uh, but if one were to take out the rectum, then it automatically excludes these two options or, or makes these two options, well, certainly excludes this one, but it takes out this one almost certainly as well. So leaving the rectum behind basically leaves us um, with a pelvis that has been untouched with surgery and therefore allows us to be able to restore some form of continuity so you can go to the toilet through the anus rather than through an ileostomy. But when we actually counsel patients, we, I, I always tend to bring up all of the options because one of the most important things is that different people have different ideas about what um, they want uh, coming into the future. And therefore, um, I think all options should be brought to the table. And eventually, um, there will be a decision which is very much a joint decision um, as to what sort of surgery, uh, what sort of definitive operation a, a, an individual would like. So for example, there are some people, and it's not the majority, who would opt for a permanent ileostomy. Um, and there are multiple different reasons as to why one would opt for a permanent ileostomy, and in which case the rectum is removed and, and the permanent ileostomy is formed. But I always tell people one thing you have to remember is that if you go down that stage, there's no going back to any of these two stages. So you have to be very, very aware that that decision that you make is, is the right decision for you as an individual. So having a subtotal colectomy or a, uh, having the colectomy and then having an ileostomy for a period of time gives an individual a, 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 the ability, if you like, 
to um, to uh, appreciate what life with an ileostomy is like. And some people think, okay, that's fairly hassle-free for me. That's the way I'll stay. Others think I hate this thing and I'm not going, I don't want it. I want another option. And none of those are wrong approaches. It's just that we've, we've got to be in support of the individual making that decision as, as clinicians. So the next common option and probably the most popular option, especially in the UK and, and most other countries is, is the ileoanal pouch. And this is the one that well, this is what, what this organization is all about. And the ileoanal pouch really is um, basically forming a new rectum. As I say, it's forming a new reservoir using the small bowel and that is connected to the anus. Now in Sweden in particular, uh, and uh, to a certain extent, some individuals here look at this option called the ileorectal anastomosis. And what that basically means is that you join the small bowel to the remaining rectum. Now, I, I haven't really <clears throat> um, delved into that too much in, in this talk because it wasn't the purpose of this, but I suffice to say that the ileorectal anastomosis is, is an option, but it's an option that's limited to very few people. And realistically, in, in my opinion, it, it, it really should be limited to those people who have very, very minimal or virtually no disease in the rectum. And that, that's not particularly common. And finally, there is this option of what we call the continent ileostomy. And, and in a sense, this is an ileostomy, but it has a, a, a very uh, complicated surgical mechanism um, uh, to create it. And, and what it basically does is it, it very much acts like a pouch, but uh, in, in the ileostomy location in the sense that it's like a balloon that'll fill up with the effluent. And then when it's full, you put a tube into it and, uh, and it empties. Now it sounds great in theory and, and, and certainly for one that works, it is a very good option. And sometimes when people have a pouch that fails, um, th this, this could be their next option. But for a number of different technical reasons and functional reasons and a very high failure rate, it lost its favor over the years, but is gradually making a comeback, mainly because of some centers in Europe uh, pushing it and, and, uh, and also one or two centers here in the UK. I have to say that uh, none of us at St. Mark's actually have the expertise um, to, to do that procedure um, uh, at the moment, but uh, it's something that uh, I have to say, I think about from time to time. But again, it's one that requires very, very careful um, consideration. Um, so I, I'm sure you guys are sick of seeing this slide by now, but this, this is the inaugural um, slide of Parks and Nichols when they first described the pouch. Uh, that was way back in 1978. And they had an S configuration to the pouch. We can sort of talk a little bit about the configurations and and while it was revolutionary at the time that they could do um, this procedure um, the s actually had quite a few problems particularly in terms of emptying and, and therefore it's not very favored these days but if you are going down the route of a pouch i, I always try to emphasize that a pouch or having an ileoanal pouch is actually a quality of life choice. It's a quality of life choice because it, it enables one to have a, a functioning, for want of a better word, rectum-like reservoir um, instead of having um, a, a, a permanent stoma. And a permanent stoma is certainly an option and, and I, I certainly wouldn't encourage anyone one way or the other, as long as any choice that is made is a well-informed choice. And those of you who are familiar with some marks would know that we have a very, very extensive counseling program that happens before any surgery, even before an individual has a subtotal colectomy um, in order to give as much information as possible. And we have, we've published quite a good book that gives very good information as well. We've got 
quite a few pouch nurses who help with a lot of the quality of life decisions. So that in a sense, um, you, um, any, any decision you make, for, uh, you, one would go with their eyes wide open. And this is very important uh, because you have to understand um, the choices you make and understand the decision-making process and be in charge uh, of uh, the decision-making process as well. So these are, these are the original sort of um, results, if you like, of Parks and Nichols. Uh, and even though you can see here that they had a very high use of catheter, as I said to you, because, um, because the um, 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 S pouch didn't empty properly. Uh, you could see that the frequency was somewhere between three to six times a day, probably more towards the six rather than the three. Uh, one of the pouches were removed, about 20% of those patients had some form of pelvic sepsis. And um, so, and, and actually the reality of the situation is that uh, the, these results are not that dissimilar to what, what, what we get now perhaps a little bit of improvement in the pouch failure rate, but otherwise um, this, this is sort of what we expect. So not, not a lot has changed in that uh, setting. But one of the important things, and I always put this slide on and I always remind uh, individuals of this because this is, this is a very, very important slide. And it basically says that the more pouches that an individual or an institution does, the better the outcome is and the less the failure rate is. So if, if and, and as, a, as a ballpark figure, we have the sort of magic number of um, 10. So if a surgeon does less than 10 pouches a year, we've, th there is evidence to suggest that their pouch failure rate, um, um, actually as an institution, if you do less than 10 a year, that the pouch failure rate um, uh, goes uh, up. So um, I, I also encourage people, um, whether it's me or anyone else, ask the question, how many do you do? Um, what, what is the failure rate uh, in your institution? Now, not all institutions will know their failure rate, but those data are readily available um, on the web if you look at the uh, annual pouch report, for example. So it's not hard to pick where, where most of the pouches are being done and, and what the success rate is. Now, you, you, you've got to be a little bit careful because there's a lag in the failure rate between where things were done. So for that, because on average, it takes about 10 years before um, most pouches fail. So you, you've got to sort of have that um, 10 year window. And so if someone is retired, for example, and there's no new surgeon doing pouches, there may be a false uh, sense. So you've got to ask the question um, 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 of your surgeon and, and, and never be afraid to ask that question because remember, this is your quality of life we're dealing with and no one else's. Because the reason I stress this point is that if you look at the national IBD audit, we can say that if you, on, on average, about four uh, pouches are performed per year per colorectal unit. Um, and, and this, I appreciate that this, this, these data are a little bit old, but I don't think it's changed dramatically. That means that uh, if, if you take two surgeons per unit, they're doing about two per year on average. And that's a very small number because it, it it may be technically feasible and they technically know what to do, but it's not just the immediate technical, it's what to do when there is a problem, how to, how to recognize problems early. And, and the more experience you have, the more, more you're able to uh, work through things. And of course, um, as some of my patients know, um, everyone comes with a little tip of doing this and doing that and something else. Uh, and, and I'm always very interested to listen. And the more, more experience and the more patients you have, the more experience you get from the collective of, of all of those patients one has treated as well. And it's a valuable resource because it's very much a two-way street. So um, this, is, this is the sort of um, looking at the pouch failure rates again, that the more, in a sense, the summary of this is that the more you do, the less that fail. 
Now, I found this, um, I found this uh, pretty much quite staggering, actually. Um, and th these data basically compared the rates of restoration, um, either an ileorectal or a pouch in England versus Sweden. And you can see that about 30% of people who have a colectomy in England versus about just under 50% of people who have a colectomy in Sweden have some sort of restoration um, um, procedure, be it a pouch or an ileorectal uh, uh, anastomosis. Now, one asked the question, if 30% if are, are getting um, a, a restoration, does that mean that the 70% have a permanent stoma? Um, the short answer to the question is yes, but I sometimes see people who have had their subtotal colectomies 10 years ago or so, and they say, you know, this, I've still got my rectal, rectal stump. And um, uh, I've been told that a pouch is not a very good operation uh, and that, it, that all pouches fail. And therefore I was asked not to uh, have any surgery. And I think that's the, that's the other default position that happens in a lot of surgical units because rather than refer people on to, uh, to other units, uh, or, or to more, more high volume units. And there are a few high volume units around the UK, very good centers. Um, uh, the, um, the default position is to say, don't have any surgery, it's doomed with problems. And it goes back to my earlier point. If you don't know how to deal with the problem, it's better to discourage someone from having surgery. And that's where a lot of people um, end up. So I, I think what we've been trying to do to overcome this is, is not necessarily push people to have their operations, but at least make sure that whatever decision an individual makes is, is, is based on the right information so that then if, if some people still choose to either delay having their pouch surgery or, or not have it at all, that's okay. Um, but at least make sure that the information gets across and that's what we try to do with uh, by informing gastroenterologists in particular about, about uh, what we can offer in the high volume centers, uh, because then they tend to send people much earlier to us to, to, look, at, um, to look at possible restoration. So I always say to people, make sure you choose the right unit and the right surgeon and not to be afraid to ask their surgeon for their uh, experience and then work it out uh, how you feel as an individual. Now, moving on to the technical side, um, I think this is where the whole concept of keyhole surgery, and that, that has been uh, probably the biggest innovation that we've been uh, going on about over the last 10 years or so. Uh, but it's ad, uh, coming into pouch surgery, A was a little bit later in, in the uh, in the evolution of uh, keyhole surgery, but also um, with, with pouch surgery, um, it, it's, it's a lot more difficult because there are a lot, a lot more technical steps that one has to be very careful about in order to prevent problems. But there are massive advantages. Um, there's less scarring, less pain, the cosmetic result is better for people, the hospital stays shorter, there are less adhesions and therefore uh, adhesion related uh, uh, problems. And, and certainly from a, from a surgical point of view, there's certain better vision and, and less um, surgical um, dysfunction. And I, I apologize for the gory picture, but that's what a um, uh, pouch looks like on the inside. This is what we call the pelvic floor here. This is a small bowel made into a pouch and it comes up and it's joined up through a stapler um, to there. And we can do it um, basically with very, very minimum, minimal invest, um, incisions. And more recently, um, talk about a minute, I, I use what we call the single port technique so that there's really only one scar, which is where the ileostomy scar is. And it, it looks no, no worse than actually having um, a, um, uh, uh, having an appendix operation, for example. Um, now, for most people, actually having a temporary ileostomy after the pouch surgery uh, is the standard. 
um, and, it, and it reduces the consequences or is said to reduce the consequences of some of the complications. And you can see that, um, and I'll come back to that in a, in a minute, but you can, you can see that um, the results um, uh, are no, not really different to open surgery uh, and, and it's really only the benefit of the um, um, uh, operation itself in terms of all the other cosmetic and other benefits. And one of the big things, as I said to you before, was that there's a significant reduction in the adhesion-related admissions um, when, um, when you perform laparoscopic surgery. And that, that is a big thing because people tend to get less small bowel obstructions. Now, another question I often get asked is when, when can we time the pouch surgery? Uh, and this is a, a question particularly pertinent to women who, who want to get pregnant. Because in the past, when um, we did open surgery, um, we noticed that if you've had a, a, a pouch operation, your chance of getting pregnant reduces quite significantly. Um, and, uh, and, and, and as you can see from this graph here to here, is quite a significant drop in the ability to get pregnant. And if you take the normal population, getting pregnant is quite hard anyway. So if you drop that quite, uh, quite a lot more, um, then that's particularly not a good outcome. But one of the biggest advantages of the, of the keyhole or laparoscopic surgery is that you don't tend to get the adhesions that you get with the open surgery that's right down in the pelvis area. So the, the tubes and the ovary are still able to float freely. And therefore we, we, we've seen that there has been no difference um, uh, in, um, in, in the ability to get pregnant uh, after, after um, laparoscopic surgery. So these days I, I advise people, and this, this has been well documented, Um, this is um, 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 not, not really an issue. But it is also important to make sure that the original operation or the subtotal colectomy is also done um, laparoscopically because if that, if that original operation is done open, sometimes it's incredibly difficult. Um, and I say the chance of converting to an open operation is probably in the order of 10 to 15%. So we can still perform the surgery by laparoscopy, even if you've had the previous open operation, but um, there is a reasonably high chance that we have to convert that to an open operation. Um, so um, th this is where, where we, uh, we, which is one of the newer innovations and has been one of those innovations that uh, I've been sort of very happy and very proud to uh, uh, perform a lot of and also perform a fair bit here um, over the last uh, five to six years. And this is what we call the bottom up approach. So traditionally um, we would perform all of the keyhole surgery from the abdominal side. And one of the problems was that is uh, there, there is this uh, bit of rectum that we always leave behind, which is the little bit we commonly call the cuff, and that's the lowest part of the rectum. And the cuff um, is, has its advantages because it allows um, the sensations to go from the, uh, the anus uh, to the brain, but the cuff, because it is rectum, can also get inflamed, and therefore it, we can get uh, one can get uh, uh, things such as called cuffitis, which is inflammation of the cuff. And cuffitis can be quite difficult to treat, and cuffitis can also be um, uh, very um, uh, debilitating in terms of uh, um, pouch function overall. And the big problem with uh, laparoscopic surgery. Um, or pure laparoscopic surgery was that um, we couldn't control um, where we were able to actually divide the rectum. So the size of the cuff varied depending on how narrow or wide the pelvis was. And so um, 
we started to remove the rectum partly from the bottom and partly from the top. And we call this the bottom up approach, which is quite difficult to, as you start to learn it, but as, as you get used to it, it's, it's a much better procedure. Um, and um, and uh, this has been the go-to procedure now set in my hands because it has very uh, good advantages in terms of the, the joint is very low. We don't need to fire a staple multiple times. We've got a much better joint and I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. And at least certainly in my series, the, the risk of the joint leaking um, uh, was, was much less um, as well. And, uh, oops, sorry. And this is the sort of um, approach we can take. We can do all of this through this one scar where the ileostomy comes through um, using this particular port into which we place all of the keyhole equipment and using this, and I haven't, I will show you a picture in a minute, but a very concealed picture uh, using this port um, we, we'll, uh, we are able to uh, place this both through the bottom and perform all of the surgery. And this is sort of operating from the bottom and there'll be another team operating from the top and we tend to meet um, in the middle. Now, anastomotic leak or the joint leaking, which is another major complication, uh, is also actually associated with um, uh, longer term pouch failure. And this is something that we have to be very careful. If you, if you get um, anastomotic separation um, and, uh, and uh, pelvic sepsis over a 15 year period, you, you would tend to look at about a 15% pouch failure rate. Um, but if you uh, have no pelvic sepsis, even with a small anastomotic se separation, your pouch failure rate drops down to about six or seven percent. It's halved. And that's and that's really important. So again, any technique that we can use to improve the risk, uh, uh, reduce the risk of uh, the joints leaking is a good technique in my opinion. And that's what we've discovered with the bottom-up approach that either they have very tiny leaks without any sepsis um, um, or, or uh, 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 sorry, without, without any um, leakage or, or only very, very small amounts of, uh, of uh, pelvic uh, sepsis or a tiny little cavity. And that, that has been one of the major advantages because when we make these joints from the bottom up approach, we have a much neater joint than, than what we would normally get uh, in the other approach. And we can also see that if you map out the quality of life of an individual, especially because uh, we, we had much less in the way of leaks, uh, you, you sort of find that their quality of life uh, is much better. But keep in mind, and as I always say to people, never judge what your pouch is going to be like in the first month. You have to wait until about the 11th, somewhere between the 10th and 12th month where, where the, the, where there is um, a bit more establishment. And that's because it's got the, the balloons got to expand to a certain level and, and maintain its status quo. Um, so what, what we've um, um, got to realize is that it's all very good to have all these surgical options and to perform good surgery and make sure that um, uh, um, that 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 um, are available, but there are various different myths and misconceptions within uh, both the medical fraternity and also within the patient fraternity that 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 lead to um, different um, choices being offered. So um, nobody really likes the concept of having surgery, and I completely understand that. But, um, that, but also people tend to be very much influenced by their treating physicians as well. So if there is, if there is um, uh, either a misconception or um, uh, n a lack of faith in the operation that's been offered, then um, 
physicians um, tend to sway people in different directions. So they might treat them with more medications, more medications, try something else, add a bit of steroid, maybe try something else, uh, and then say, oh, well, what you need is a, is a permanent uh, um, uh, stoma. But actually, if, if you look at the quality of life between a well-functioning J pouch and medical treatment, it's actually quite equivalent because you don't have to take the medications, you don't have to go uh, weekly or whatever, um, uh, so you don't have to inject medications weekly and so on and so forth. But unfortunately, sometimes everything is colored a little bit by the poorly functioning pouch. And I wouldn't deny that there are a group of patients and we quote about 10% where the pouch function is absolutely abysmal. And, 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 um, and a little bit will depend very much how an individual makes a decision about who you talk to, how you look at uh, probability and statistics, whether the glass is half full or the glass is half empty, uh, and, um, and really um, the information that you get. And I think the information that you get um, is very important. And we as healthcare professionals have a responsibility to make sure that it's completely non-biased and tailored to the individual asking the question because everybody's different and everybody's way of us. Uh, what, what drives different individuals to make different decisions very different. So um, I'm, I've sort of um, gone way over, I think, or probably not, uh, uh, but I'll sort of finish there and we can then uh, have a good discussion. Um, so I think definitely the ileoanal pouch has evolved over the last years. And I think uh, laparoscopic surgery has not only made it more acceptable, but actually, in my opinion, probably made it a lot safer and a lot better procedure. But it needs to be done in centers with high volume. And I think as surgeons, and as certainly uh, my main objective is to actually perform the surgery as best I can to try and reduce the failure rate. And that for me in particular is about trying to reduce the risk of um, anastomotic leaks because some of the other ones are a bit harder to control like pouchitis, for example. But the, the, the main thing is to make sure that at least we can minimize the technical failures um, so that uh, most patients have a very good outcome. So thank you again for having me and uh, uh, we can uh, go to discussion. Well, that was absolutely excellent. Thank you, Janindra. Some really, um, actually, I thought we'd get the same slides last year, but there was a lot of new stuff in there. So that's really refreshing. And I think one thing that strikes me is the depth of analysis now that you're presenting of um, correlations with good outcomes in terms of the surgery and long-term outcomes in terms of life with a pouch, which is really fascinating to see. And it's obviously informing the medical profession moving forward. And this correlation with experience we've seen before, the experience of the surgeon, uh, we saw it in the pouch survey, 2017 pouch sur survey. And it's fascinating to see how that's evolving. Really yeah. interesting. And anyway, my, part of my role tonight is to be the conduit from our fabulous audience as well with a whole host of questions for you. So they're gonna come thick and fast, Janindra. Uh, no, so, that's um, okay. That's all right. If they are happy with that, then I'll, yeah. um, on behalf of the audience, I'll read out the questions. I think that's probably uh, easiest. Otherwise we'll get all sorts of background noise, but um, please shout at me, anyone on the chat function, if, if I'm not representing your question right. So let's start with a couple of nice, easy openers. So Ben Barbanel asked, uh, a good old friend of, of Red Lion Group, how many pouches in total have you done in your career? So I've done, uh, I, haven't, I, haven't, I can't tell you the exact number, but at last count, it was just over 150. So that's in my 10 year career, uh, accepting the fact that there was a little bit of a hiatus uh, last year as well. So yeah. Uh, it's, it's over 150. Does that make you one of, one of the most experienced in the country? So, um, I, I mean, I'm very nervous about saying this, uh, 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 but uh, 
in terms of the annual volume, I, I, I think I am the highest volume surgeon, although Malcolm Dunlop in Edinburgh might disagree with me, but let's, call it, <laughs> let's, say, let's say England for safekeeping. I'll be straight on the phone to him tomorrow morning. Um, <laughs> No, that's fantastic. And, and again, we're really honoured that you're speaking to us. And uh, uh, that's fa fantastic. And your, your experience uh, speaks volumes. So that's that's terrific. Um, why, Sylvia asked a great question. Why was there a migration away from W pouches to S pouches and now the favoured uh, configuration of a J pouch? So um, the S had a lot of trouble in terms of emptying. Um, the W uh, has um, the W has um, a, a, a lot of um, uh, stitches, and it takes a long time um, to make actually, uh, uh, because uh, uh, if it's it's sort of like having the seams of a football, it's got to go in uh, uh, multiple different layers, and and the more layer, more stitching you do, the more risk that any of those stitches can leak. So, yeah. so there's, even though the W in theory will uh, empty a little bit better than a, a J pouch because it's a slightly bigger reservoir, um, it, it had other issues in terms of uh, leaks, et cetera. And also it, the convenience of making it is, is um, it's not that convenient to make a W pouch. So the J is very easy to, to make it, um, it's, um, in a sense, uh, it uh, fits, especially in a narrow pelvis, quite nicely, and there, there isn't uh, too much trouble. And it can be stapled rather than hand-sewn, because one of the big problems with hand-sewn uh, uh, joints is that you, you, you have to um, take away all of the cuffs, so the, the, the leakage, you might compromise cuffitis for leakage. Yeah, yeah, indeed. So, okay, that's great. And, and the outcomes with J pouch are very similar to S pouch and W in terms that's of correct. function. That's ex yeah. correct, except, yeah, except for the emptying issues you get with the S because a lot of people had to use about 50% of people need to use a catheter to empty with the S pouch. Yeah, yeah, okay, that's great. So uh, several questions, Jendra, around this issue of experienced um, surgeons. So uh, one question, I think it's from Elaine asking, um, how do people find out where the higher volume centers are for operations? So you can actually look it up because there is a, there is a pouch um, report. It's a few years old, but it will give you a reasonable idea because these, these don't change dramatically. It's published by the Association of Coloproctology and it's available online. It's the, it's the annual pouch report. 2018, 19, one of those. Was that the annual pouch survey by the Association of Coloproctologists? It wasn't, uh, sorry, it wasn't annual. It was a pouch survey by the Association of Coloproctologists. Look at it while you we discussed. I think it was called Pouch Survey. And it, I think it surveyed around about 5,000 pouch operations. And that's the biggest sort of reference document I've seen. That's on um, our website, David, as well. Yeah, we've got it on the pouch support. I think I said pouchsupport.com. It's pouchsupport.org. Can you um, can you see website. that? Yeah. That's the one. Yeah, got it. Yeah, so for those of you who are um, sort of, it, it's quite a technical read, but the, the, it, it's absolutely jam-packed with facts about uh, pouch operations, pouch um and, and, and in there, there's it doesn't a, there's mention a, surgeons, but it mentions institutions. Centers, yeah. Yeah. So there's a top ten in there. Um, um, if you scroll down, I forget which page it was on. I was looking at it the other day, but there's a top ten uh, in terms of frequency of pouch operations. Uh, it's very close. So it it tells you all about uh, which areas and how much laparoscopic surgery, for example, is performed. Yeah. Um, and it also uh, talks a little bit about outcomes as well. Yeah. But one of the findings of the survey was that more experienced centres generally had better outcomes. So that, that, that's your top 10. Yeah. 
There you go. Um, so th th there are some overseas centers, but you can see that uh, uh, St. Mark's ha had the highest number followed by West in general in Edinburgh, which is where Malcolm Dunlop is. Uh, hence my, uh, and, and they are a very high volume center. Uh, yeah. Obviously Oxford, uh, again, then going down Liverpool, their efforts, so on and so forth. So do you know who the experienced surgeon in Edinburgh is? Uh, uh, Malcolm Dunlop. Malcolm Dunlop. So there you yeah. go, Elaine. Uh, sorry, Alison, Malcolm Dunlop. Um, and Alison's asked if um, we can send a link. Alison, if you log on to powersupport.org and have a look, you'll find it. There you go. Thank you. You're very welcome. Um, I'll put it in the chat as well. Oh, that's useful, yeah. Um, I just have to... Uh, negotiate this. So a related question from Trudy. Um, so Trudy wasn't given the option to have a pouch initially by her local surgeon uh, because he didn't do them, uh, but he, he didn't offer referral either. And it was only because Trudy was reasonably well informed about her, her surgical options that she did the research herself and identified a surgeon uh, who happened to be Mr. Jenkins. Um, is that a common situation in your experience? And is there a role for patient support groups like Kangaroo Club and Red Line Group and the Pouch Group of the Osteo Association to lobby for better um, information for patients and for surgeons? Um, I, I, would, I, I would say so because, um, you know, um, I think the way people are looking at surgery and, and their options is very different. I mean, um, e even from, you know, 10, 15 years ago, uh, or about 15 years ago when I first started to, to now, the, the, the level of information that people have is, is amazing. And actually, the more I talk to people, the more I learn that they don't necessarily patients don't necessarily get their information from other healthcare professions. They look at face group, Facebook groups, patient forums, and various other, other uh, uh, areas to, to get, get the information. And so I think that in terms of disseminating the right information, and as I said, this is not necessarily about Try, trying some sort of medical evangelism to convert everybody to having a pouch because it's not for everybody. But I think if it is for an individual, that option should be available. It shouldn't be shut down. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that's, that's what, uh, that's what it, it should be. So, so my feeling is that, you know, as clinicians, we try and do our best in these sort of forums are really very good to talk and be as open as possible and discuss uh, things um, in a very generic way, if you like. Um, uh, but uh, having said that, I think I think the patient forums are very good to, to disseminate the right information because there are lots of people who've already made up their decision to have a, um, uh, um, um, if you have a, a you know, will we'll, uh, have, have made up their mind to have a permanent stoma, but, but would still like the information and see whether it is something to consider. And I think if you have all the options and the information in front of you, you make a better decision for yourself. Yeah, indeed. That's terrific. Thank you. Um, just a, a quick practical question, and then we're going to come on to some questions about pouch issues and pouch problems. So, um, just bear with me, uh, questions, people have asked those questions, but one quick practical question. How, how, what's the waiting list now for pouch surgery at St. Mark's, roughly? I, I won't quote say, you. This is, no, this, is, this is the embarrassing bit, but it, it, <laughs> got a little bit, it got a little bit worse after the pandemic. But at the moment, uh, uh, um, it, it's, it's somewhere around the six to nine month wait. Um, on the NHS to do um, a pouch, so uh, it, it, it it does take a long time, and I, I have I have to say I, I I would cry if I look at my waiting list right now, especially yeah. after the pandemic, because we've yeah. had nowhere. We've only literally just started operating back 
a much lower pace since last year, really. Wow, because of COVID. Yeah. Yeah. Well, gosh. I mean, I'm, I'm, I don't know if you know, but we've, we've sort of got a new, I don't know if it's even permanent or temporary, but we've got a yeah. new home. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's, it's sort of like the first floor's done, but we haven't got the rest of the floors. Yeah. Yeah. No, we've heard about that. And uh, we've also heard about the confusion about whether it's temporary or permanent. So uh, we are all confused about that. Yeah. I mean, we have Jason Bacon, who's um, head of the uh, chief executive of the St. Mark's Foundation. He's going to be talking in another talk in the summer forum uh, later on in the year, and he might be a very good person to quiz about that mm. uh, when when he um, when he speaks. I don't have the date to hand, but it looks nicer though. It doesn't look like Chanel. <laughs> well, as long as you guys are still there doing the operations, I'm yeah. sure we won't mind as a patient population. Um, so, all right, some questions now about uh, that have been tabled about problems when people have problems. So, um, pouchitis is, is something which a few people experience, quite a few people experience, and in some people it can be um, uh, sufficiently bad to warrant um, excision of the pouch. So, um, how, how often do you prescribe uh, antibiotics for pouchitis? Uh, before trying steroids? Is there a standard? Um, pro yeah, so is, is the protocol is always antibiotics first. Yeah. Uh, and uh, a little, a, a, lo a lot of the time, uh, you would only need one or two doses uh, of either metronidazole or ciprofloxacin and sort of, uh, and then it sort of settles down. Um, and so, and, and, but, I always say, you know, sometimes if you if you biopsy a pouch or look at a pouch for whatever reason, there may be a little bit of inflammation for whatever reason, and then everyone says, "Oh, I've got pouchitis." I I think if one is treating pouchitis, one has to treat the manifestations of it rather than treat a little bit of inflammation. But um, and, and so, I, if my my philosophy usually is don't don't do anything if it's not symptomatic. Yeah. We don't, we don't, um, we don't use steroids. Uh, so that's almost never. Uh, uh, we, in extreme circumstances, once we've gone through a pretty hefty, um, pretty hefty uh, protocol of rotating antibiotics and uh, so on and so forth, uh, um, uh, then we might consider uh, people to have biologic agents like infliximab, which can work in some circumstances. Yeah. Um, but one of the things we as clinicians often ignore or not ignore, but sort of don't think about, and that again boils down to experience, is that sometimes if you've got pouch and it's not working particularly well, people and you in a telescope and it looks a little bit inflamed and then people will give antibiotics and it gets better and then you just keep giving antibiotics but what what people have missed or what the clinicians have missed is is a leak a chronic grumbling leak and that will also give you inflammation as well so we always do an mri before we confirm pouchitis to make sure that the inflammation is not secondary to a leak yeah. but it you know and, it, and it's 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 a bit more complicated than that but it's it's just part of the algorithm we use to um, diagnose pouch problems yeah indeed and 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 related to that um if if people um have to have a pouch uh, reversal uh, due to antibiotic dependent pouchitis um or sorry antibiotic resistant pouchitis uh, can this be done laparoscopically um the short answer to the question is yes, but it depends. It depends very much on whether the pouch was also, if it was done laparoscopically, it can be removed laparoscopically. And I do a fair a few operations laparoscopically. If it was done open, we can certainly try, but there are some vital uh, organs there that can't be damaged during that surgery, which, uh, so if it's very stuck, then we would convert it to open. But I'm finding that more and more we can remove laparoscopically because we use the same bottle 
up approach as well um, to try to, to remove uh, the pulp. So yes. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, Karen Peaver, I will ask your question. Don't worry. I will. But we're just going to focus on a sort of theme of pouchitis, uh, and um, um, I'll carry on with that for the time being. But I'll definitely get to your question, Karen. Don't worry. Um, so. A question about, um, uh, this is from Julie Taylor, if she's been treated in a sense that it's not so experienced and she's having problems with a pouch, is it possible for her to be referred to a specialist centre? Yes. Such as St Mark's. And yes. How, how so, does she go about doing that? So the best way to do it is to get the GP to refer. Um, uh, I'm embarrassed to say that I don't have the email to hand, but our pouch, <laughs> nurse, our pouch nurses are incredibly good. In fact, I can probably find it and put oh, it Oh, that's in. right. Um, our pouch nurses are incredibly good at um, uh, yeah. helping uh, answer emails. They'll take a little while, as we all do, uh, um, but uh, they are very good at um, uh helping direct in the in the right direction maybe just give some pre preliminary advice and then wait for a referral so to speak but I, I think uh, gary gary would you mind um yeah gary i'll post the link uh, to the in the in the chat function to the, the email just thanks gary getting gary working there. okay um just just while um Gary's posting the link there. So basically, um, uh, Zara has said to us uh, before, Zara, the uh, head of the pouch oh, nurse yeah. specialists, has, has said that St. Mark's increasingly is a tertiary referral centre. So yeah. primary referral would be your GP, secondary referral would be a, a local hospital. hospital. And tertiary is where the local hospitals would refer That's specialists. Correct patients onto a specialist center so yeah. St Mark's now has such a reputation in, in in the pouch world that it's now a referral center for hospitals so and, and that's a regular thing yes yeah. yeah so definitely I wouldn't hesitate I wouldn't hesitate to get a referral uh, as, as Janindra has, has said thank you very much Gary thanks for posting that um Let's just talk about pouchitis for a little longer. Jenna has posed a great question, really good question here. Is pouchitis just a matter of bad luck or are there things that make it more likely to occur um, um, and some things that we can do to reduce the risks or is pouchitis just bad luck? So I'm going to start by saying bad luck, but, and, and, and the reason I say that is whenever we don't know what the cause of something is, we say bad luck. <laughs> Uh, but um, but um, we think now uh, that there is, uh, and, and there's sort of more and more research coming on, that there is a, uh, I'm trying to refine the right word, but the, the, the concentration of various bacteria within the pouch, the good bacteria, as we call it, is in the wrong configuration or wrong, wrong concentrations uh, of one versus the other. We, we are not sophisticated enough at the moment to say it's these ones versus these ones, but um, we know that th there are groups of bacteria that you see more frequently in patients with pouchitis. So increasingly in those sort of antibiotic resistant patients, we would culture the pouch effluent um, and see whether any particular bug is coming up that would, um, that, that, that uh, is sensitive to some other antibiotic and sometimes that work. But the interesting thing is the con converse of that, say using fecal transplantation, for example, hasn't really worked particularly well in pouchitis. And, and maybe, I mean, fecal transplantation is another one of those things where everybody thinks it's the most wonderful thing, but who's got the golden stool? I don't know. And I don't think we, we know that. Um, so it is, it is uh, still like um, looking for the right golden stool in terms of, and I think that's perhaps why, um, why uh, it's not as successful, but I think that's quite a few years away before we would work that out because the bacteriology world is a completely different ballgame. I think there is a lot of work going on on the influence of the microbiome, which mm -hmm. is the, the gut mm. bacteria. 
and a strong strong feeling that the microbiome has a has a has has an impact in terms of potentially causing uh, colitis and inflammatory bowel disease, or, yeah. or maybe a contributing factor in that. Yeah, and I think that's a that's a tremendous line of research. I think uh, we we fund uh, every year we fund some great research which is ongoing at St Mark's into various aspects of the diseases uh, that that cause um, colectomies can lead to formation of pouch, the need to create a pouch. And I think that's a really good thing for us to be doing in terms of understanding, trying to help the scientists and medics understand the causes of inflammatory bowel disease. Absolutely. Um, okay, so, right. So you've got a pouch and you've had your pouch for a few years and it starts to misbehave. All right, so we've got a couple of um, comments I'll spare, I'll spare the uh, people's blushes, but uh, one, one lady who has narrowing, which needs stretching twice a year, uh, very much a sort of mechanical problem. Are there any advantages in pouch reconstruction or, um, I don't know, a nip and tuck type operation, whatever, whatever you want to call it, that might improve the function of a pouch uh, that is generally performing well, but has some mechanical challenges. I think stretching is, a, is another, um, a symptom that I've heard about, mm. uh, which causes problems in older pouches. So I think usually um, um, in terms of stretching, it's because for some odd reason and not always understood why the joint tends to narrow down and, and then you have to push really hard through that narrow joint. It could be sometimes because the joint is a little bit too low uh, or, or it, it just could be related to the way everything heals around that area. Mm. The problem is that um, if, if particularly if the joint is too low, they, they is, um, 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 they, they isn't really uh, much one can do because there's nowhere else to disconnect it and rejoin it again. Uh, I always, that the other thing is, I say, as, as annoying as stretching, once or twice a year might be, and, and sometimes we give patients dilators to take home so that you can self-stretch so that you don't need to keep coming in to have, have, have an anesthetic. It, it's about trying to work out the, uh, if any time we try to redo a pouch or try to do that, the failure rates, the complication rates, and all of those things are much, much higher. Yeah. And, and, and so, uh, um, and so uh, um, I, I, I think that it's, it's about trying to balance the risk versus benefit in, in anything. Yeah. Um, because okay. if it's been happening for years and it's complication free, then I would stick to that. Okay, great. And, and just extending that there, the other uh, question on that same line was, to do with an inverted um, pouch shape. Um, I think it's described as hour shaped, if you've come across that. Yeah, I, I think that's a little bit harder. And, and, if it, and again, a little bit will depend on the symptoms an individual has with that, because if it's functioning okay, then you just leave it as it is. If it isn't functioning okay, then we would do our best to look at ways of, um, look at ways of, doing things conservatively as much as possible. For example, and I'm, I'm talking completely off the top of my head right now, but um, it may be that catheterization of the pouch to empty it might be, might be the option. So, so just to, to extend that, the, que the question it went on to say, is there, is there a laparoscopic operation that can be performed to salvage? And if so, what is the success rate? Yeah, so-, so Very specific. The, sh the short answer is, again, goes back to what it, it depends on whether the pouch was done laparoscopically or not in the first place. Because if it wasn't done laparoscopically, sometimes it's very difficult because essentially we have to take the pouch out, disconnect the pouch, take out the hourglass bit and then rejoin the pouch. So every time you try to do a redo surgery like that, this, this, the failure rate goes up. So there is a, that, so the, in the consent process, we would always say that there's probably a 10 to 20% chance that you would lose the pouch um, that, or probably even more. There's then of course, 
go back to the same conversations about pouch failure and losing the pouch as a result, yeah. um, uh, risk of leaks and so on and so forth. So, you know, again, when I, when I have conversations like this with people about redoing pouches, I, I always say we have to be very, very, very clear about why we are doing this. And, and that means that you really want your pouch, you're willing to lose it if, if things don't go right. And um, and um, you you've got to understand that it, it may go horribly wrong and you'll be in a worse position. It could that one could be in a worse position than where they are right now. Yeah, I mean you've got to take that whole thing into account. Yeah, yeah, okay. So um, Adriana has extended this this conversation. Karen, I haven't forgotten your question. Don't worry. Um, Adriana comments that if she's experiencing pouch failure, is it is it possible uh, for the pouch to be disconnected for a while? Yes. Or, I mean, Andrea said in the question, um, can it be done in a way that I can try how I get on with a stoma bag first due to my bad experience with temporary stoma, or is it irreversible? So, um... I try my hardest not to remove the pouch unless there's a very good reason to remove the pouch in the first operation. We always go to the stoma bag first to try and do that because then there is that option of reversing it. Yeah. Um, but a little bit would depend on the circumstances. Yeah, so essentially, and, and this is very difficult actually, we're putting you right on the spot, but you're not familiar with the patients uh, background or their history or the, the yeah sort of, and so just on behalf of Janindra if I just say that to everyone who's asking questions it's very very difficult uh, for Janindra to give definitive answers without sort of having the holistic picture so uh, um, you see Janindra is just too nice a guy to say that he's too nice anyway anyway right let's get to Karen's question because it's a very serious question and um it's, it's quite a specialist question as well. Uh, let me find it. I'll get there in the end. Oh, where is it? Okay, what, what, I'll find it in a minute, but what Karen, the, in, the essence of Karen's question is, would you mind talking about um, a J pouch for someone with asymptomatic PSC? So, um, and there is no contraindication to actually having a pouch if you have um, PSC and particularly asymptomatic PSC. Yeah. Um, the only thing I say about that, and I, we give the same risk of leak, we give the same risk of everything else, except for uh, um, um, except for the fact that your risk of pouchitis could be higher and we don't know why people with PSC have a higher rate of um, uh, pouchitis, but it just tends to happen. Yeah. And it can be quite refractory pouchitis as well. So, but again, it's not everyone with PSC who gets pouchitis. So I, I take a very pragmatic view. Um, I, I, know, I know there are some of my colleagues around the UK, so PSC is an absolute contraindication to a pouch. I, I, I don't, I don't take that view much like, uh, I don't take the same view with Crohn's disease as well, because there are certain circumstances in Crohn's disease, particularly where there is no disease of the anus, where, where, we, would, where we would say, if you want to pouch, that's okay, but the failure rate is much higher than in ulcerative colitis. So there's always a but in these things, so that, you know, again, it boils down to the information we give an individual, and then you can make your choice. If, 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 for example, you've spoken to 10 people and seven of them have pouchitis in your cohort, then you have a much different view to if you talk to 10 people and only two had pouchitis and the rest were doing mm. great. And it just depends on which 10 you choose. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, hopefully that's, that's answered the question and thank you for that. Just a, just a couple more, if we can squeeze the yeah. engine, Indra. I know that uh, time's, time's catching us up, but um, just a couple more. So um, diet, 
is often uh, a, a real hot topic for pouchies and on the various forums in in certainly in red line group forums this this crops up again and again but um the probiotics so vsl and uh, vivo mix uh, is there is there any evidence to show that they uh, are really good for the health of the pouch and in particular in relation to preventing pouchitis so the only evidence has been with vsl3 uh, and, and again, it's slightly sketchy. Yeah. Um, um, but um, um, I don't know much about the others because there's no real evidence as such in terms of preventing pouchitis. But then again, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very wary about knocking anything and saying it, it doesn't work because you know, we, we, we as medical professionals sometimes discount the element of faith uh, and and that element of faith is very strong, uh, and I think I think we and if you if you really believe that something is working for you, then there is no reason why anyone should knock it. Exactly. <laughs> but equally, I think it's very important that people don't advocate it from yeah. their own experience as being an absolute predictor of what will happen for other people so yeah so my baseline yeah my baseline is basically try anything see whether it works or not and i like to know so that i have it in my sort of somewhere in my mental database <laughs> okay can can i make this the last question everybody i know the questions are coming thick and fast which is a, a testament to your your uh, ability to answer them so well janindra so uh, but uh, I think there's a really good question popped up. A, a lot of pouches fail um, because of a misdiagnosis of um, the inflammatory disease. Um, and the person actually has Crohn's instead of ulcerative colitis and outcomes of pouch surgery with people with Crohn's um, can be very difficult compared with people with ulcerative colitis. Um, so the question, uh, this is from Jenna, um, is there any way of doing more testing to check that you don't have Crohn's before going down the pouch route? So um, we always um, do uh, what's called a um, subtotal colectomy uh, first, and, and that gives you, for want of a better word, a big biopsy, because there's the whole colon to look at. And most of the time that will come back as ulcerative colitis, and then in some patients, it'll come back as intermittent colitis. It just means that th there are features of both within it. It's not that it's one or the other. Now, if you have indeterminate colitis, there is a chance that that, that could probably progress. But what we say, um, uh, when Professor Hart and I often do a joint clinic with, uh, um, uh, for patients who are looking at surgery and this question comes up all the time mm. or, or, or there'll be people whose pouches are failing and, um, and we sort of say it's probably Crohn's disease at this point in time and they say well they didn't diagnose that and the problem is that inflammatory bowel disease itself is a spectrum yeah so it's not it's not black and white that this is ulcerative colitis and this is Crohn's it's, it's more an inflammatory bowel disease and it follows a spectrum. And there are lots of splits in the middle that we don't know about. And, and, and um, the more I, I learn about um, Crohn's, for example, the more I learn that even within Crohn's, there are so many different phenotypes of the way the bowel looks, where it goes and so on and so forth. Mm. Acidocolitis is a little bit different, but still follows a similar pattern. So I don't think that it's a misdiagnosis in the initial state. And I think that's the important thing. It's just that in some people, there is this immune mechanism that drives it. And then we call it for want of a better word, Crohn's, but it, you know, we, we could give it another name as well, just yeah. as well, because I think, I think it's just the, the behavior of the inflammation that is the issue. Is there any evidence that um, having a pouch encourages um, wider inflammation in the no. digestive tract no. no not not necessarily no. um so um we know that at least in crohn's disease if you exclude the bowel sometimes things will get 
better, but as soon as you put things back together again, it, it can um, it, it can all flare up. Yeah, yeah. Okay, how are we doing for time? I think I think we've probably kept you long enough. No, it's my pleasure. It's my pleasure. I think we've just about um, asked all the questions. Just about. I know there's a couple uh, that haven't been asked. So my apologies to the people who tabled them, but um, may I uh, draw this session to a close and um, thank everyone for their attention and all the great questions. Um, I'd like to thank um, Gary for pressing all the right buttons, our IT guru, and uh, Chris who um, persuaded Janindra with his, um, with his charms to um, present and in fact has done an awful lot in setting up a whole host of um, um, uh, speakers in this summer series, which is fantastic. Thanks very much, Chris. Um, we've got Elsa, is it Elsa Hart? Professor Elsa Hart, you mentioned in your answer there. Yeah. Um, she's also speaking in, in, in this series. So please look out for, for yeah, Elsa. Talk. This gives a very good talk. Yeah, so it's extremely interesting. So most of all, can I thank on behalf of everybody attending uh, yourself Janindra for a fabulous talk and um, wonderful wonderful answers to a barrage of questions uh, some more difficult than others I'm sure but um, absolutely fantastic and thank you so much for your time it means a great deal to pouchy patients and potential pouchies and family and friends of pouchies uh, that you take time out in your evenings to um, um, you get very busy life to to give us a talk. So thank you so much. And I can see now there's a cascade of uh, gratitude coming in on the chat. So on behalf of everybody, many, many thanks indeed. No, it's my pleasure. And thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure. Thank you. Okay. We'll have you back next year. Thank you. I'm That'd delighted to. Okay. Thank you, Take everybody. Care. The next in the series, if I can just say, uh, the next in the series of uh, webcasts, summer webcasts is Professor John Nichols, known to uh, many, I'm sure. And he's gonna be talking about pioneers of modern surgery on the 19th of May at 7.30, uh, register at pouchsupport.org. And there's also the next um, Pouch uh, Support Forum. This is a sort of open chat session, uh, which has been extremely successful. We have them the first Monday of every month, generally. Um, although uh, this Monday being uh, this uh, May, uh, third being a bank holiday, we've deferred it to next Monday. So Monday the 10th of May, if you'd like to join for a general discussion, um, um, you're very welcome. It'd be nice to have you along. Thank you very much indeed. Um, thanks again to Janindra and safe journey home everyone. That's my little joke.